You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go, it's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know, go to buy Piccadilly. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 171. This week I would like to once again thank everyone who supports this podcast on Patreon, where they get access to special Patreon-only episodes, or for just $1 a month, ad-free versions of these very episodes, every single one. You can head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more. Last episode, we discussed the American attack at Sammy Hale. This week, we will focus on their attack during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. It was here that Foch had taxed the Americans with attacking through and around the German strong defenses within the Argonne Forest, with the goal of capturing the rail lines that lay about 50 kilometers behind the front. These rails were critical to the German war effort, with the quadruple-tracked rail line between Sedan and Metz being the sole east-west route in the area. The fighting here would be very different than during the first American attack. There would be one similarity, basically a colossal advantage in terms of men and material for the Allies, with over 1.2 million men in the attack, including 220,000 French. These large numbers of troops would give Pershing an 8 to 1 advantage in manpower, and he would also have a 10 to 1 advantage in artillery. The similarities would mostly end there, though. Sammy Hale had been a quick and clean operation. Meuse Argonne would be the opposite. The attack would begin on September 26th, and it would run all the way until the end of the war on November 11th. During that time, the German defenders would prove that they were not as easily defeated as the Allies believed, and they would once again show what a determined defense looked like, even against a foe that was far superior numerically, if not tactically. The Americans would also find that they were not an unstoppable force, and their goals for the first day of the attack would not be met after three weeks of fighting, and after that they would still have many problems. What Pershing and the Americans hoped would be a quick dash through the German lines would instead devolve into a very long slog. The end result would be a battle that would cause the most combat deaths for American troops in the history of the United States. Over 26,000 men would die during this operation. For those wondering, according to Wikipedia, this is 7,000 more than the second place battle, which is the Battle of the Bulge in 1944. Many of the American troops that would take part in the opening days of the attack were new to the fighting. Some had just gotten off the boats in Europe and had come directly to the front, barely having fired a rifle. For some, this would also be their first action, even if they'd been in Europe for a while. And for almost all, it would be their first experience in woodland combat. One of the key problems that this caused, especially for those with little woodland experience in their civilian lives, was around navigation and positioning. It is very easy to get lost in the forest, especially when it's foggy like it would be in the opening days of the attack of the Meuse Argonne, especially in stressful situations like combat. This confusion would cause units to get mixed up and out of position, and for entire battalions to become lost. That was all in the future, though, and on September 25th, the troops, regardless of their abilities and experience, prepared to move to the front lines. At this time, all of their extra equipment was turned in, and they took with them only what was needed for combat. This included overcoat, helmet, gas mask, canteen, reserve rations, and of course rifles and ammunition. A small note on gas masks, when the American army had come to Europe, they had decided to use a gas mask of British design, which, while just as uncomfortable as every other gas mask, was at least effective but prone to fog uh, after extended use, a problem exacerbated by the wet atmosphere of the Meuse-Argonne fighting. 
Once the men were properly equipped, they moved into their positions. Some would find these positions closer to the front than others, but one universal feeling was an extreme hatred of waiting, which we've experienced several times throughout the war as we talk about what these soldiers were thinking in the hours or days before an attack. One soldier would say that, quote, slimy rats played tag with us while we waited for our artillery to commence firing. Waiting was the hardest job. The minutes seemed endless. Others had to do more than just wait, with some units receiving last-minute additions to their gear. Here is Major Whittlesley, who we will get to know quite well next episode, discussing a late arrival for his unit. They issued us bombs, and at the last second, after dark of the night when we were about to pull out, with no candles available and everyone set to go, they tried to issue us with newfangled rifle grenades, very complicated and with a tail. The infantry would have the support of 4,000 guns, which would begin to fire around 5.30 on the 26th. This allowed for a three-hour bombardment before the infantry attack began, a relatively short time, but also roughly in line with what everyone else was doing in 1918. Once the attack had started, back at headquarters, the always nerve-wracking game of waiting began. Major General Leggett, commander of the American First Corps, would say that a staff officer, quote, has done everything he could before H-Day, or if he has not, it is too late now. He can do nothing more until the first reports come in. To try and follow the infantry is folly. He can see much less than he can at a map at headquarters. To try and pass the time, he would play cards with his officers while they, waiting, while they waited for the first reports to begin coming in from the front. While the officers waited at the, behind the front, things were very differently in the trenches. Private Joe Rizzi would say, quote, At zero hour, we started on our greatest of all adventures. I cannot truthfully say that I was not somewhat afraid, yet I remember I did not in the least hesitate to scramble up the trench on the word, let's go. Once the infantry did go forward, their experiences differed wildly. On some areas of the front, they found the German defenses completely destroyed, as Private Ray Johnson did. He said that he would find the German positions literally pulverized. Everywhere, on every side, nothing but yawning shell craters cluttered with broken timbers, twisted bars of steel from dugout roofs, broken rifles, torn German packs, and all sorts of debris. It gave the impression that a gigantic series of dynamite charges had been exploded. The attack was by no means a positive experience for most of the troops, though. During the morning of the 26th, there was a thick fog that settled over the battlefield. Throughout the course of 1918, this type of morning fog had greatly assisted attackers in their attempts to assault the front lines, but those had, not, those had often been on very different battlefields. Here in the forest, it often just resulted in confusion. The officers leading their units could not see very far in front of them, and when they ran into unexpected terrain features, keeping on the correct line was almost impossible. That is without even considering the German defenses that they would run into along the way, even if it was just a few trenches and strong points that were scattered in the areas between the American positions and the primary line of German defenses that were positioned a bit back from where the Americans started. One experience that many soldiers were not prepared for was the smell, and this comes up in several different first-hand accounts. It's the smell of stagnant pools that had built up over the years as artillery fire and construction had disrupted the natural drainage systems in the area. Added to this was the upturned earth of the recent artillery, which uncovered the consequences of past fighting in this area. While the smell might not be as pleasant, it did not stop any of the attackers, but the Germans were doing a pretty good job of that themselves. Throughout the day, the German machine gun nests caused constant problems for the American attackers. The American troops were brave, and they charged the German guns wherever they were found, but this just had the expected results. They would often capture the positions, but only at heavy cost. Even with the difficulties along most of the front, the advance did move forward. The French would advance about two and a half miles, and the American First Corps had a hard time, but in some areas of the front they would advance almost four miles. To the right, the Third Corps advanced even further. This meant that on the right, the Americans were actually almost on schedule. But along most of the front, the advances were less than were hoped, and many of the units, even those that had done well, were very disorganized, with units becoming lost or mixed up as they tried to continue the attack in such a confusing situation. The problem, and it would be this for most of the attack, was in the center, with the 5th Corps and their attack on Montfaucon. 
Mafakon was a hill that rose over a thousand feet in elevation, giving the Germans a perfect observation and artillery post. Pershing wanted it taken immediately, with the goal being to have an attack directly against the hill, while other troops also moved around to get behind it. With advances on both sides of Montfalcon, it, it was hoped that the troops attacking it directly would just basically be taking over positions that the Germans would have to give up. Against the German defenses on and around Montfalcon, the 79th Division had been slowed and then stopped. The problem for the infantry around this area of the front would be a familiar one for any troops of really any of the battlefields before 1918. The wire had not been sufficiently cut by the artillery, and it had taken time to manually clear it. During this time spent clearing the wire, the infantry had fallen behind the creeping barrage. Communication back to the artillery was difficult, and so instead of resetting the barrage, the artillery just kept moving forward on its schedule. This left the infantry to try and advance without the benefit of artillery support, and we all know how that goes. It doesn't go well. It would not be until late in the afternoon that the officers behind the front would even realize what was actually happening. After the infantry had spent the entire day trying, mostly unsuccessfully, to continue the advance. At about 6 p.m., with troops barely out of the woods where they had started their attacks, the offensive was halted by the officers on the scene. Officers here, with it growing dark, believed that the attack would be stopped and then restarted on the 27th. When Pershing learned of the situation, he ordered General Kuhn, the commander of the 79th Division, to launch another attack immediately at night. There would be no time to move up new troops, and so those that had been fighting all day would just have to continue. Orders were sent out to the front to begin the attack at once. When the attack started, there was once again literal artillery support falling in the right places, and again the infantry was slowed by the wire, this time in the dark, and wire-cutting teams took even longer to clear lanes for the Americans to continue forward. Once the infantry was on, was on its own, and this time they were fighting an enemy that was hidden in the darkness, they tried to push forward, but any gains that they did make were often surrendered back to the Germans due to the slow and steady attrition of German fire. Montfalcon would stay in German hands. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean Spiced Tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Behind the American front, traffic jams were the norm during and after the first day of fighting. This made it increasingly difficult to get anything to the front lines to continue the attack, and this also meant that any further advances would have to take place without the benefit of more ammunition, food, or water. Even the artillery was not immune to these supply problems, and would have issues replenishing their stocks of ammunition before the 27th. There was no question that the attack would continue, though, but without the ability to move more troops forward, those that were already in line would continue the next day. For the troops in front of Montfalcon, they would just have to stay in whatever positions they had taken during the day. Often, these were cold and wet positions, and they were forced to ration out their food, without any real idea of when more might reach them. 
Behind the front, Pershing was livid about the situation. He believed that the failures on the first day were wholly due to the lack of drive among his officers. During the night, he would send a message to all of his corps commanders, saying, quote, Commanders will not hesitate to relieve on the spot any officer of whatever rank who fails to show in his emergency those qualities of leadership required to accomplish the task that confronts us. Quote, These types of threats would continue for basically the rest of the war, as Pershing consistently believed that part of the problem was that his commanders were not pushing hard enough. On the other side of the line, the Germans were still not convinced that the American attack was the primary point of effort on this sector of the front. The German leader, General Galwitz, still believed that this was just a diversion, and a more direct move towards Metz would be the primary attack. It would not be until very late in the evening on the 26th that the Germans would be convinced that this was actually the primary attack, and only after several more prisoners were found and interrogated which confirmed this belief. German reserves then started moving forward to the Argonne, which was good, because even though the Germans had put up a good defense on the first day, by the end of that day, some of their divisions were down to just 3,400 men, a fifth of their establishment, and roughly the size of an American regiment. During the night, it would rain over the battlefield, a rough situation for the wounded strewn about due to the fighting on the first day. By dawn, it was heavily raining on many areas of the front, and the fog had returned, a heavy fog that would persist throughout the morning. Again, the Americans would attack even though they were cold, low on ammunition, and by this point were running on very little food. The attack would be launched along most of the entirety of the American front, but for the most part, they made very little progress. One positive advance was in the area around Montfalcone, where they took the village that shared its name. There were some small advances here and there, but nothing of real note. Pershing would once again be quite angry, as he usually was. Attacks were then ordered for the next day as well, this time with deep objectives planned that mapped roughly to what had been the objectives on the first day of the attack. While the Americans were getting frustrated, on the German side the situation was actually improving. Golfitz felt that his defenders had done a great job, and the German troops were getting stronger and stronger literally by the hour as more reserves were brought into the line. During the 27th, they had lost a bit of territory, but those defenders that had started the day in the line had held the defenses enough so that the reserves, when they arrived, came into a situation that was not in chaos. Positioning of units in the general situation was known, and not the confusing mess that sometimes happened when defending against allied attacks. Generally, the units would arrive, know where they were going, and then arrive, and the situation would be roughly similar to what they expected. The Americans believed that the 28th would be a critical day. Pershing would send out a message to his troops that said, quote, There is evidence that the enemy is retiring from our own front. Our success must be followed up with the utmost energy, and pursuit continued to bring about confusion and demoralization, and to prevent the enemy from forming his shattered forces. I am counting on the splendid spirit, dash, and courage of our army to overcome all opposition. Our country expects nothing less. End quote. On this day, the attack would once again continue, but for the troops at the front, the situation would continue to deteriorate. The 28th was another rainy day, and American morale would reach a new low, as the troops in the front had been fighting for three days, with essentially no fresh food or water reaching them during that time. When the infantry did go forward, their advances were less than hoped, and by the time the sun set, it was clear that the Americans would probably have to change something if they wanted the attack to proceed. The first corps on the American left was particularly worrying for Pershing, and so he went to visit General Liggett at his headquarters. During this drive, it took Pershing an hour and a half to cover two and a half miles on the roads behind the 35th Division. That's even with the fact that Pershing had the highest possible transit priority. This is just one example of how bad the traffic situation was behind the American front, and why it was so difficult to get anything forward. After visiting Leggett, Pershing decided that several divisions along the front, those that had suffered the highest casualties, would probably need to be replaced, and while that would take a few days, he hoped that it would imbue the attack with a new impetus. In the meantime, the attacks would not stop, and instead on the 29th, the attacks would once again continue. The 29th was once again wet, and by this point, the Germans had moved six more divisions into their defenses of the Kreimhild Stellog. The presence of these new German troops was the most pronounced on the American right, up against the Meuse River, where the greatest American successes of the first day had been made. 
The German defenses in the Kriemhild Stelhag had been the objectives for the first day of the American attacks, but entering into the third day of the offensive, they were still not captured, and in some areas Americans still hadn't even gotten to them. As the Germans recovered from their earlier issues, they began to criticize how the Americans were launching their attacks, with one German officer reporting to General Galwitz that the American troops that would attack on the 29th would attack with, quote, thick columns in numerous waved echeloned in depth and preceded by tanks. This kind of attack offers excellent targets for, our, for the fire of our artillery, infantry, and machine guns. Provided the infantry does not allow itself to be intimidated by the advancing masses but remains calm, it can make excellent use of its weapons, and the American attacks fail with the heaviest losses. End quote. For many American officers, the first great task of the day was just getting their men up to ready to try and fight. Some of the men that they tried to wake were dead. Others had to be shaken repeatedly before they would wake up just from sheer exhaustion. When they did wake up, they found that there was once again no hot food, very little cold food, and they had another day of hard fighting ahead of them. Sergeant Triplett would write about the state of his men, saying, quote, The outfit looked horrible, and I knew just how they felt, exhausted, sleepy, hungry, worn down, and sick. Worst, they didn't feel lucky anymore. They'd lost the soldier's bulletproof ego, that feeling that others may get hit, but I never can. I knew how they felt because I felt the same way. I knew that the next time I, was, I stuck my head out in the open, I'd catch a bullet in the teeth. Not even the clowns were wisecracking anymore. With the troops entering their fourth straight day of combat and being at the end of their endurance, it should not be surprising that the attacks on the 29th were less than successful. By the end of the day, even Pershing was forced to admit that he had to call a halt to further attacks. It was now critical to get new American troops into the line, and fresh supplies as well, to meet a now much stronger German resistance. September 30th would see far less fighting along the front, and everyone was thankful. That did not mean that the situation was pleasant, and the troops had to stay in the line, in the cold, muddy, wet line, but at least they did not have to try further attacks. The exact number of casualties on both sides during this period has a huge amount of variance, mostly due to the very short break in fighting between the end of September and October. American casualties are estimated to be between 26,000 and 50,000 during the last week of September. For this price, they had pushed forward a maximum of 7 miles, but on much of the front it was far less than that. Most importantly, the strongest German positions still remained in German hands, and they would have to be dealt with if the offensive was to continue. If it was to continue, the logistical situation behind the front would have to be dealt with. By the end of the month, the entire logistical train behind the American army was breaking down. Nothing could get forward, nothing could get back. Lateral movements were almost impossible. These problems were caused by American disorganization, and also the large number of troops crowded into this small area of the front without good or plentiful roads. The situation, the logistical situation, would not be an easy knot to untangle. I hope you will join me next episode as the Meuse-Argonne Offensive continues, and we focus a lot on one single battalion that just so happened to get lost. My